Welcome to our last conversations program of the fall 2020 season. This has included uh, talks with artist Kathy Opie, archaeologist Andrea Scholl, and the new AAR director, medievalist Avinuam Shalem. These talks have reached uh, larger audiences due to the necessity of Zoom but they also show the variety of the disciplines which are so active at the American Academy in Rome. I'm Mark Robbins, uh, president of the American Academy in Rome. And for those of you who don't know us, the Academy is a center for the arts and humanities, which each year gives the Rome Prize to artists and scholars. This supports uh, time for them to live and work in a residential community in Rome. The work that's produced in Rome and the ideas that are inspired there have an impact on culture for generations to come. I'd like to say a special thank you to the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation for their continued support and sponsorship of the Conversations Conversazioni series. Tonight's evening features uh, a resident and an Academy Fellow who in fact met at the Academy. We're always proud of these uh, conjunctions. Uh, critic A.O. Scott and filmmaker Garrett Bradley. Each uh, through their work embrace the complex narratives of American life. In Garrett Bradley's film, 2019, entitled America, and we'll see a clip from that briefly, is made up of 12 short films by the artist intercut with footage from an unreleased 1914 film, believed to be the oldest surviving feature length film with an all black cast. Here, the contemporary voice is in counterpoint with history, a witness also to erasure. A.O. Scott's current series in the New York Times uh, book review, The Americans, is also the power of stories, in this case, the hand, in the hands of writers, who show us, as he says, who we are. He continues, culture wars have always been part of the culture. Still, the homegrown literary imagination has shown the ability to flout, to short circus, circuit, and even to transcend the simplified, sl sloganized language of politics, quoting Henry James, the complex fate of being an American. This depth of exploration on the way in which we are American is fitting for an institution like the American Academy in Rome in this point in our nation's history. A.O. Scott, Tony as he likes to be called, worked as a book critic and he says modestly became a film critic only accidentally when the New York Times hired him in 2000. He was named chief film critic in 2004, becoming the critic at large, which he is now for the year, which has allowed a wide field for his incisive writing. We can see his work in the book review and in other publications and the New York Times magazine. Tony also makes frequent appearances on radio and television, especially during Oscar season. The American series, which I referenced, um, you can see the third of the uh, installment of this in this past Sunday's um, book review. In 2013, Tony referred to academia and is currently a distinguished professor of film criticism at Wesleyan University. He was a critic in residence at the AAR last season. Garrett Bradley works across narrative, documentary, and experimental modes of filmmaking to address themes such as race, class, social justice, and the history of film in the United States. In addition to winning the inaugural Philip Gustin Rome Prize in the Visual Arts in 2019 at the American Academy in Rome, Garrett has received numerous prizes, including the 2017 Sundance Jury Prize for her short film alone. 
which also became an Oscar contender for short nonfiction filmmaking. Bradley's work can be seen across a variety of spaces, including her second unit directing work on Ava DuVernay's When They See Us and the 2019 Whitney Biennial. In January, Garrett became the first Black American woman to receive Best Director at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival for her first feature-length documentary called Time. And uh, you can see this on Amazon. Uh, Garrett's first New York solo exhibition just recently opened on the 21st and is presented as part of a multi-year partnership between MoMA and the Studio Museum in Harlem and features a multi-channel video installation of America. Uh, the show will be up until March of 2021. Just a few quick notes about tonight's program. Uh, we're in a webinar format, so uh, unfortunately not interactive, and all of our guests are muted at this point. Um, but please do forward your questions, which will be collated and directed to the panelists for their Q&A. We'll begin this evening with a short film clip from America and then begin the discussion between Tony and Garrett, followed by uh, questions and answers. Thank you again for joining us tonight and um, we'll begin with a clip. Thank you, Mark. Thank Hi, you. Garrett. Hi, Tony. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. It's great to see you again. Um, as we were saying before, before we started, I think we began a conversation um, in Rome in January, uh, where we kind of were talking a little bit about art and criticism and film and our, our um, various overlapping interests. And then it was um, interrupted first by the triumph of your trip to, to Park City to the Sundance Film Festival, um, and then by a whole lot of other things that have happened, um, including, um, most happily, the, uh, the release of Time, uh, your, your film, um, on, on uh, Amazon um, this fall, and now just very recently, the, uh, the opening of your exhibition um, at MoMA. Um, so I wanted to begin with that, to begin with the most recent thing. Um, the, the, this, this installation um, at MoMA, which I have not yet had a chance to see in, its, in, in that site, um, but I'm familiar with, with, with some of it um, as, as um, film work. Can, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about what, what it is in the museum setting um, and, and what, what kind of themes it's exploring, what kind of story it's, it's telling? Yeah, well, it's funny because I actually, when I started this project in like 2014 almost now, um, I had always conceived of it as being something that needed to sort of exist outside of two-dimensional space, it like needed to be physical. And it wasn't for me about being an artist or being a filmmaker or any kind of distinction someone wanted to make about that. It really was for me uh, the most kind of inherent um, way in which a visual chronology could be realized. Um, America is, I can give like a, just a little bit of background that I just offer some context. Um, 
you know, I read an article in the newspaper, I think it was 2013 when I read it, that the MoMA had found what they thought to be the very first feature length film with an all black cast and integrated production team starring Burt Williams, who was making more money than the president during that time. And, um, you know, and, and this idea of like an integrate, like you had white people and black people working together just several years after Plessy versus Ferguson, which was in 1896 which is also the same year that the modern day projector was invented. So you had like the beginning of Jim Crow, but also technology for the first time bringing people together. And when I saw just snippets of the material, I was just, I was really struck by like the pleasure and the joy and this sort of like nostalgia for the future almost that I, that I, that I really felt from the crew and from everybody participating in the film, even though Bert was in blackface, it was very clear that there was a certain strategy and power dynamic that had been set up in order for the making of that film to even happen, right? Um, that he's giving direction to produce, to white producers. Um, and that this is an integrated effort uh, toward a black, a sort of singular black vision, you know, in at this time period. And when I was reading this article, I noticed there was a link at the bottom of the, the at the bottom of it that was, that brought me to the Library of Congress and the Library of Congress had just done this survey that said that 70% of the films made between 1912 and 1929 were missing. So it was roughly 7,500 films. And so America is, it's, a, it's basically making an assumption that those 7,500 films were equally as progressive cinematically, socially, um, and it's, this, it's an attempt to fill the gap. Um, and so I literally just tried to find other years where amazing things happened or very mundane sort of quotidian things happened that I wanted to recreate. And I put parameters on myself and I said, I wanna to try to limit us to work, to have to having similar constraints that filmmakers did at the turn of the century. So I knew it had to be silent. I knew it had to be on film. I knew it had to be in black and white for that reason. And how can I as sort of a contemporary filmmaker work within those limitations? How can I think about a sort of contemporary silent film um, and I started in 1915 and for whatever freaking reason, I don't even know why I was like, we're going to do 12. No. <laughs> Just like we made 12. And so the film needed to be something that people could, could move around. And I made it as a single channel film as well, because that was going to have an, an easy way to find a home, an easier way to find a home than, than something, um, that requires space, you know? Um, but there's a lot I could say about the installation itself. I don't want to over talk, but um, <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's uh, it's interesting what you're saying about because it, the the sort of the the um, the imagined or reconstructed um, history. Because of course, 1914, 1915 um, in in conventional uh, American film history is associated with birth of a nation, um, which is very much the opposite of the kind of progressive vision um, and, and sort of, you know, collaborative idea um, mm -hmm. that you're talking about. Very, very sort of violently in opposition in a way to, to the very idea of that, the kind of the, 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 the ideological text of, 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 of Jim Crow. Um, and so there's something very, um, very both scholarly and also utopian in a way about the idea of putting into this place where there aren't films that have survived, um, not more uh, iterations of Birth of a Nation um, or, or of the sort of um, the, 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 the Jim Crow segregated um, movie industry that, that came up in its wake, but of another kind of um, history. And, and how did you, I'm just curious about your sort of your process of, of finding, of researching, and also maybe of kind of imagining or calling into being these these countervailing images. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you for that because it's it's so it. I mean, first of all, I I wanted to start with 1915 for the same reason that Birth of a Nation came out in that year, and they think it's you know when I was doing research and the museum did an incredible amount of research and just trying to figure out the history of this film because it was found as sort of a series of unassembled outtakes and they think that you know the producers essentially pulled out because what they were doing was too progressive right mm -hmm. so i liked the idea of being able to sort of pick up where something had been lot left off to sort of reclaim um, a space that had been thwarted um 
and that immediately set forth for me a certain certain uh, decisions around image making, right? Like 1915, immediately thinking about the white sheet and the fact that the white sheet is sort of this like mundane object that that really changes its meaning depending on who's holding it and how it's assembled. And so we see that white sheet go from sort of a KKK costume to something to something super mundane, just like a bed sheet that goes on a clothing line, to then being reclaimed by Buffalo soldiers who are historically uh, black social aid and pleasure club. And this was their, the New Orleans chapter. They've been around since the turn of the century as well. And there's multiple chapters all over the country. And so for me, it was like finding these sort of points, points in history that then I could play with in a certain kind of way. It's also why the installation is made in these sort of four intersecting white flags, which when you go to MoMA, you actually have the benefit of being able to see above it as well as sort of a cross, right? This sort of crossroads and intersection, a place where surrendering opens up visibility for what's been erased to a certain extent. Um, and then there were other moments that weren't kind of overtly connected to race in any kind of way, but that were great opportunities for me to play with inserting ourselves into the image making and symbolism of what's American. At like 1916, the next year, Woodrow Wilson established the Boy Scouts of America. Hmm. And like, you know, the aesthetics around that are are very white and very male and 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 have a you know a certain kind of iconography around them. And I liked the idea of working with my students who were Boy Scouts and inserting them into the sort of cinematic canon and um, and creating, you know, ideally you can pause the film at any point and it could be like on a cereal box, you know, or on a billboard and mm. it could exist. That's also why I called it America because I wanted to kind of disrupt the algorithm of how, of the symbols and images that exist that represent our country, you know? Um, so it was kind of like, yeah, I'd find a fact and then I'd just try to run with it and play with it and, you know, as much as possible. Can can you talk about the 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 role that um, that music plays in that? Because I I, I think you know there, there's an iconography there's there's a, there's a visual vocabulary that that suggests a certain kind of American um, experience or, or 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 culture, and then um, there's also a, a there's also sound, and it and it is fascinating that this um, the original clip the uh, Lime Kiln Club Field Day. Um, which is silent, and I don't think there, 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 there's no, there's no sound or no, no sheet music score that that survives. But there's a lot of music and dance on on screen, but but it, you 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 don't you don't hear it. So what what was the what was what was that kind of layer, the 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 sonic or musical um, layer of this of this reimagining that you were doing? Yeah, I mean it was. Well, so when we think about like, what does it mean? Like, there's something really fun that I don't, I even want to keep playing with, you know, in some ways of like what it means to make a contemporary silent film, because like the history of sound in filmmaking is, is kind of interesting one because it started off, you know, with, as you said, like sort of live musical accompaniment to, to picture, which also changed depending on what theater you in, you were in, right? Like, which was sort of like, you get a completely, and for anyone who, who's, who's at all privy to sort of the editorial process, that's very profound because the music completely changes how you see something, you know? Um, and so we went from that, then when sound was introduced, you would have like just music and just dialogue. Like there wasn't, it was kind of existing in these like very clunky, ways and as sound has started to evolve in the cinematic canon and you probably know more about this than me i'm gonna sound like a bit of an idiot so you're gonna be like yeah these are the basics um you know it, we got into like more and more kind of minutia of like a cup being put on the table right like what we call foley and and now we're watching films and i don't want to say i don't want to call it noise in a critical way but our our films are so filled with every single sound that you could possibly think of. So what would it mean to try to kind of deconstruct that part of it? And I knew I wasn't gonna have a uh, dialogue, but, um, and I knew that I wanted to incorporate the sounds that were sort of uh, inherent to the geography that we were in, right? Like to have real wind sounds and have sounds from the streets of New Orleans where we were filming. So we hear, you know, sirens, even though we're in uh, a horse pen, right? Because we were in New Orleans East, right? So being able to embed those things as a part of the narrative. Um, but we also then, you know, it came to me of one, and this actually came towards the end. So the musical part, so I'm talking in terms of sound right now, mm -hmm. the musical part of it really was very, very difficult for me to pinpoint. I was listening to Florence Price. We were blasting F Florence Price on speakers the whole time we were shooting. It was the most fun when you don't have to worry about sound. You can just play music while you're shooting, right? 
one of the last vignettes is dedicated to Florence Pius. She was the first woman ever to have uh, her music played by a major orchestra, black woman. Um, and, but it didn't end up fitting really. And, I, and then I got kind of lost and I was listening to like weird meditation gong music on YouTube and like putting it to picture. And that was also weird. And then um, it was actually Glenn Ligon who reminded me of Looking for Langston, Isaac Julian's mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. And I rewatched that film and I was so far, I mean, this was like months before we needed to picture lock. We've, worked, we've been working on it for like five years, right? The fact that I hadn't seen this film before and I, and everything that he that Isaac was doing in that film was something I was also really grappling with and trying to think about. So I, I looked up who uh, composed it and it was Trevor Matheson who was part of the Black Audio Film Collective. And the Black Audio Film Collective was kind of uh, also asserting what it means to be a black artist, a black filmmaker in the '90s in a different kind of way than what was happening. You know, it's sort of the resurgence of Spike Lee in the state in the states. Like, what is iconically black? Is it a monolithic experience? Is it not? Right. So I liked the idea of being able to pay homage to Isaac's film, to to be able to work with Trevor and to sort of bring in the history of the Black Audio Film Collective, and then blend that with a lot of this sound work. Um, and that's what it kind of ended up being. And you hear voices throughout the film. And those are recordings um, that we did where we would just go up and ask people if you had to, what's the difference between the United States of America and America? Like, what's the difference to you? Is there a difference sort of philosophically, right? Or if you had to explain America to an alien, how would you, like, a, you know, from outer space, how would you explain it? And so you hear people, everyday people answering these questions and that's embedded throughout the, the piece, you know? Which is another way of, I guess, dealing with dialogue uh, as a silent film in the present moment. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think of, of, of bringing not exactly a, a narrative element, but a, but a sort of a, um, a discursive element, say, um, in, in, into it. So yeah, it's a, another dimension um, along with the, the, the images and the music and along with your, your images and, and the original um, Bart Williams images. Um, I mean, this suggests to me a lot of interesting segues to time, which on the surface is a very different kind of project than America. Um, it's, it's, it's a documentary feature. Um, it, 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 it tells a story um, of, uh, of a real woman and her, and her family um, in Louisiana um, as, as she's trying to get her, her husband um, out, of, out of prison where he's been incarcerated for, for 20 years as she's been raising their children and, and, and making a life for for herself, but there there are aspects of it that I want to kind of um, focus in on that that be, that do link with the 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 aesthetic and the and the project of of America. And there are a few of them that we've just mentioned. One of them is music, is the way that you use a musical score to draw together um, the 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 this this story, which you tell more or less out of chronological order. There is, there is an, an arc, but you go back and forth um, in time uh, without, you know, without signaling it, without a little word on the screen that says, you know, five years later, three years earlier, later that month, the next day. Um, you're just in the flow of experience and memory and time. And one of the things that keeps that flow going is music. Um, but another thing that it struck me just now talking with you the, these 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 two projects have in common is the use of a visual archive. Um, that is a lot of the images that we see in time um, are not images that you shot, but images that that came to you um, from from uh, Fox Rich, your 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 subject. So I'm sorry that was a very <laughs> that was a very rambling prelude to a sort of um, very general question about how you came to tell the story in the way that you did. Um, what, what, what you were trying to do in taking what could have been a much more conventional documentary, you know, about a person and her struggles um, and making it into something that is um, so kind of rich and, and, and textured and so full of, of implication and feeling beyond even what's being kind of said and, and, and represented. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, I think that the, so it's funny because so much of the challenge when I was making America, you know, and, and America came before, before time, um, 
there were certain things, as I mentioned, that I knew to be true in terms of what it must have taken in, in terms of Bert for Bert in order to make this film, right? And then him wearing blackface was certainly a sort of concession, but it didn't take away from his power for, and from his nuance and from the brilliance of that production. And when I was making, when we were making that, that film, Obama was president. By the time we were finishing it and it was gonna go and premiere, Trump had become president. And so I couldn't really take for granted anymore that the things I intuitively knew would be would be abundantly clear to viewers. And so there were certain tech, there were certain things I had to learn, you know, and develop certain methods I had to develop in looking at the archive, which was to say that the archive appears fixed, but it can be made flexible. And and how can I do that, you know, in two dimensional space, one frame at a time? And those same challenges presented themselves with time. Um, in a different kind of way, you know, the first way was that I really thought I was making another 13 minute film with time, you know, that it would be a sort of sister film to Alone, which was with the New York Times Opdocs, and I, and I still think it's a sister film, right? But I was, I was very, very no narrow in my focus there. Like I was, I was going into this every single day and saying to myself, first of all, it starts with a conversation always, why Fox do you want to make this film, right? Why? talking to the family about having a real sense of creating transparency and a sort of unified intention for why we want to do this. And to me, the, what they said to me was, we want to make this film because we feel our story is the story of 2.3 million other American families and that our story can offer hope. And so then my job, I felt as a filmmaker and as an artist was to say, well, hope can be very general. What does that actually look like in sort of cinema, in, in specific terms that I can then translate cinematically? And that turned into these sort of three pillars, which was love, which was unity, being able to stay together over the course of 21 years. It was their ability to hold on to their individuality, to who they, who they, who they were, what their soul was, amidst a system that was intended to break those things down. And all three of those things became sort of the, the physical rubric for the way in which the film was then structured, because none of them are chronological, none of them are linear, all three of those things surpass all space and time. And so we used the gay broads who cut the film, we said, okay, anytime we're weaving in and out of the archive and coming into present moment or the past moment, it needs to be reinforcing those three pillars. You know? We have we have a clip that illustrates what you said. I think really, yeah, yeah, really, course, yeah. really beautifully, so that 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 people um, who haven't uh, had had the had the pleasure and 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 the privilege of of, of seeing the film can get a a, a sense of, of of what you mean. So why don't we just a little more than a minute? But um, it, it's uh, it's a lovely piece of this. is influenced by our emotions. It's influenced by our actions. Before they turned into men, they would have a chance to be with their father. I have to say, when he says time is influenced by our emotions and by our actions, it's one of the most profound things. I, I, I just, because it, you usually think of it as the opposite. It's time that has the influence. It's not that we influence time, but just the way that you put this movie together shows that he's right. Um, that that our experience of time, that the reality of time is influenced by our emotions and, and our actions. Um, and just say a little bit about this clip. Tell us also about, about the music, because I think you, you, you really do hear in this how it, 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 it draws together and kind of pulls out the, the, the deep emotional content of the, of the film. Mm. 
Yeah, well, so, well, I'll just add really quickly, actually, with that clip and with Remington, her eldest son, who that's a white coat ceremony. So that's actually the beginning. Uh, that's sort of your entry into dentistry school. Um, you know, you, you had just mentioned something about memory. And I think memory is also a key part of what he's of what he's saying and, and how we wanted to structure the film, because memory is one of these things where the moment we remember something it actually, it becomes the present moment. It could have happened 20 years ago, right? It could have happened 50 years ago. The minute you feel it and remember it, it becomes current, it becomes present. And we wanted the film to feel like that. We wanted it. And I also did those recordings in, in many ways to help me also further understand how to embed their experience into the film so that you can't separate um, who they are and, and their perspective from the actual physical entity of the film itself, you know what I mean? Um, the music, so Emma Hoy, um, I had all these like 1970s like playlists on YouTube and Emma Hoy's music just popped up. It was just the algorithm, just the cosmic algorithm just like gave me this gift and I came across it, loved, loved the music. Gabe and I put it to picture. I was like, this is it. But, but, but really what like I think sealed the deal was then when I started to read about who Emma Hoy was. Mm. And she's a 96 year old Ethiopian nun. She's still alive. She came from a wealthy family in Ethiopia and was a prisoner of war. She's a, a prodigy, pianist prodigy and was trained in Western classical music and decided instead of becoming famous that she would become a nun. And so she went back to Ethiopia and this one recording that was made in 1963, uh, she agreed to do for the purpose of raising money for an orphanage. Um, and I just love the idea. And also when you think about 1963 of what was happening in America, you know, relative to also what's happening in Ethiopia, there's just something really important and special about that. And I, and I just love the idea of bringing Fox and Emma Hoy together, you know, in time and space in, the, in 1963 with the present moment, you know, it just was cosmic. It was one of those things like, how could we not do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, and it emphasizes what you were just saying about, about the reality of, of, of past time, because what I, what I love about this clip, what it, and what I think it indicates about the film that's so extraordinary, is that it moves from this ceremony to an earlier moment of, of Fox with her, with her sons, but it's not a flashback. It's not a, a thing that, that you know, is, is a sort of a, a standard film technique of moving you from the present to the past and marking the past as the past. Every, just as you said, every moment of this film is the present. Um, and it, it creates this, this sense of, 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 of kind of going backwards and looping around, but it also moves forward. There, there also is the kind of the, 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 the way that, that Fox, because she is so intent on, on seeing her husband again, on, on, on getting him, um, free um, is looking forward, you know, every day and every year. And at one point she talks about how every year we're sure that we're going to see him again before the end of the year. And then, you know, you get around to Thanksgiving and you reset and you're going to do it for, for, for another year. So mm -hmm. there, there's something about the, the, the push and pull between the, that kind of linear forward motion and the, and the backward pull of, of, of the past that, that really kind of is summed up in the, in the title of the movie. <laughs> and it's kind of, I mean, I, I never thought about this, but there's something about the way you were just explaining that too, which was so beautiful. It kind of was like, well, that's also like the power of painting, you know? And it kind of shows that the adolescence of filmmaking in that way, you know, that like, we're just like struggling so hard in that medium to like, figure out how to address what paintings just inherently do so gracefully and easily. <laughs> that's true. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's something that someone who has spent some time in Rome, you know, especially is inclined to say, because the, 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 the whole thing about being there is, you know, the, 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 the presence of the past and you, you, like you walk into any museum or gallery and you see these faces that are, you know, five, 600 years old, or these sculptures that are, that are, you know, 1500 or 2000 years old. And those people are so real and so present um, and so there. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, maybe we should uh, open it up to some, I think there are some questions that have started to, um, to gather. Um, let's see, let me go into the 
into the Q and A, and and please do all of you uh, out there um, send your questions in and uh, on through through the through the chat um, rubric. And uh, here is one um, for Garrett about time. Um, please describe your experience of working with Fox. What was it like having this person's story? in your hands um, that wasn't your original story? Hmm. Well, I met Fox in the process of making my short film called Alone. Um, and I'll just say briefly that the purpose of that film for me was to facilitate a series of intergenerational conversations between women who were in incarcerated families. And to and who very much I think Lon in 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 Lon's case felt she felt very isolated. There are very few people she felt she could go to talk to, and so I contacted an organization called Flick Friends and Families of Louisiana's Incarcerated Children, and Gina Womack, who's the director of that organization, said the first person you need to speak with is Fox Rich. And so Fox was briefly in alone, and I got to know her in the process of making that film, um, and it became very clear to me that it was important to continue the conversation around incarceration from a sort of inherently familial point of view, from a black feminist point of view, um, but also from a point of view that was that was connecting the facts with the effects, right? That we don't always get to see the effects of incarceration. Um, and so my first conversation with, with, with Fox was to kind of establish if our intentions were the same and in, in why we would want to make a film together, you know? Um, and I think once I understood what her intention was and I had established what my intention was, which I mentioned earlier, which was again, offering hope, uh, showing the other side of incarceration. Um, I wanted as much as possible and I want all my work to feel like it is a celebration of the people that I'm working with. And I think when you work in a documentary context in particular, and I actually am not interested in really talking about genre until I, I kind of feel like that's up to everybody else, I guess, and it inevitably is tied to this idea of a market more than than anything else, you know, to a certain extent, which is a whole other conversation. But, um, you know, I think that in a documentary context, sometimes we have this idea that in order for something to feel real, we need people to be vulnerable, we need to see them cracking, we need to see them failing and crying, right? Um, and I actually prefer to lean into the beauty of how somebody wants themselves to be presented. I'm interested in leaning into who, how they present and move through the world, you know? Um, and that that in and of itself is also a, a beautiful type of revealing um, that can live outside of propaganda. It's still the truth, you know what I mean? Um, and so I think my process in working with her was one that was very much, as every film has to be, rooted in a place of trust and, around, and clarity as much as I could offer without knowing, of course, where the film was gonna go, when it was gonna be finished, there's so much you don't know. Um, but we stayed in communication. She understood why I was shooting what I was shooting, why I wanted to be at Remington's White Coat Ceremony, why I wanted to do you know, sessions of them talking about what time meant, means, why I wanted to meet with Miss Peggy. It was, there was never uh, a lack of clarity around that. And I think that that's what helped us bond throughout the process of making the film. And, and how, how were, um, how, how did the, the other material, the material that she herself had shot um, over the years, those, those um, home videos, um, although there's so much more than that, those, those, um, those films, how, how did they come into the project? Um, and, and how did you kind of set about incorporating them into what you were shooting in the present? Yeah, well, so I I wasn't aware of the of any of the archive while while I was shooting. Um, I it was like on our last day of filming. I remember saying because again I thought I was making another thirteen minute film, right? And so I said to Fox, "Okay, I'll come back and I'll show you what I have in a little bit." And she handed me <laughs> this this black bag of just ton, tons and tons of of tape. Um, and it was sort of like, I, I always like to say, it was like my worst nightmare and my dream come true because yeah. it's like everything, you have to rework your thinking around every part of it. And ultimately, you know, Gabe and I sat down and we watched all everything, every single bit of it um, without any parameters, without any sort of expectations. We weren't trying to kind of shape it or put it in a corner in any kind of way, just really letting it wash over us. 
And then I think it went back to, well, fuck, how are we going to do this? This is crazy. How are we going to do this? And it just went back to that conversation, which I think for any documentary filmmaker who's watching this or anyone who, who works in a collaborative way with community, conversation and dialogue is, is the basis. It's the bones. It's everything of what you're making. And that conversation that I had with the family before we even started filming is what allowed me to understand what to do then when I was handed all of this archive, right? Because it went back to intention. Um, and again, like I said, it was it sort of boiled down to hope and what does hope look like cinematically and how then am I moving in and out of what hope looks like? That's, that's really, that's great. Um, here's a, a question sort of stepping back a, a, a little bit, but not, not unrelated, I don't think, to what you were just saying. Um, uh, someone wants to know who have been your influences, artists, activists? Um, did you have some while you were growing up and while you were coming into your own as a, as a filmmaker and an artist? Yeah, I mean, I had the great privilege of um, actually interning for Linda Good Bryant when I was in high school. Um, and she was working on a film with Laura Poitras called Flag Wars documentary. Um, and it was my first exposure to like professional filmmaking um, to people who were had built a life for themselves, women who had built a life for themselves and become filmmakers and were actively, you know, working with with community um, as a sort of intrinsic part of, of the work, you know, that you couldn't separate community from the film and vice versa. Um, and so I think just having exposure to that at a young age was really encouraging to me because I think, uh, and this is a very gendered kind of recounting of my experience, but when I was younger, it was a lot of the guys like, would get together and like make films and like help each other out and like hook each other up. And like, none of the girls were like, we were all very independent, but like no one was like making, no one had time to make a film with me for free for no reason, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it was like a real kind of space of solitude um, that helped me develop a language, um, but that was then kind of encouraged by this internship. And I think by the time I was in graduate school and I decided to go to graduate school because I studied religion as an undergraduate, um, and I, but I was still really passionate about making films and wanting to understand and learn the process and tradition of filmmaking. Um, I met Billy Woodbury there, who mm. was teaching at CalArts at the time um, and was working at the equipment office at UCLA. And I spent a lot of time with him. And I, I learned about, you know, what they call the LA Rebellion, but is really just sort of like uh, an adaptation of post-Italian war neorealist cinema that was adapted, you know, by Black filmmakers in America and Los Angeles in the 1970s. And thinking about that time period, um, it was sort of like when I was exposed to like films like Killer of Sheep, for instance, and, and um, you know, even Daughters of the Just, Julie Josh's film, it was like almost like a coming home where you're learning about, you're, you're learning how to become an artist and how to be a filmmaker in terms of its craft, like outside of this idea of a, what a career is, right? right. But you're also realizing like, I don't know how to explain this exactly when you're learning something and you're coming home to yourself all at the same time, you know, it's like, I guess that's just what confidence is, or maybe that's what inspiration is <laughs> simply put, you know, um, but this idea of working with the resources that were available to you and creating poetry and addressing large, large questions and issues around American history without, but in the specificity of the human experience, you know. Well, that that's what I think is 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 so remarkable about your work, and I think that the link to the to the to the L A rebellion makes a lot of sense because those are filmmakers who who are both working on a very large conceptual and and thematic scale. They're 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 asking um, urgent political questions about um, about American life, about racial justice, about the you know the, the the situation in 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 cities about how people live but they're asking them in in these very specific um in in terms always of 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 a lived immediate reality um and and i, and I think that that's that's you know what what is striking both i mean both of your projects that we've been talking about have these enormous titles america and time <laughs> you know which are these gigantic complicated abstractions you know that 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 people have written volumes and, and, and libraries about. But you, you, you deal with all of those, those large questions in terms of, of, of specific images and, 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 and lives and um, faces. We had one question asking for a bit more of an explanation just of what we were looking at 
in that section of of of, of time of uh, of America that, that that we saw. What, what oh, of America? What, what, yeah. The 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 baptism. Um, yeah. Um, so that was a vignette. I mean, so it's so. First of all, I should just say, anyone who's in New York, I hope you guys will go check out the show um, at MoMA. It's up till March twenty first. But it's you know I was so that film was nineteen seventeen. Um, and I was, you know, I was like, it was one of the, it was one of the first years that all the Negro spirituals were actually published in a public forum. Um, and so I was thinking about crossing the river. I was thinking about crossing Jordan. I was thinking about water. A lot of the things that I had sort of written about were too big that for us to actually shoot. And I liked the idea of sort of the simplicity and, and working in this church that was um, in the seventh ward of New Orleans that had this incredible mirror that was on the wall. Just it, the images that, that I could create in this space and within the confines of those very, very big ideas were exciting to me. But I think to address the question, you know, America is looking at mo individuals and moments in time in black history to say, of course, that this is American history, right? That it's not just black history. And sometimes it's very abstract and sometimes it's very literal. But this idea that images can stay with us sometimes just as long as facts do, right? Facts mm -hmm. or text does. And that if we can populate our space and our mind with powerful images, we, to a certain extent, are counteracting the ones that already exist and we're creating new facts within ourselves. So maybe it wasn't super clear, but I think that's okay. And I hope that they felt beautiful to that person who asked the question that they'll stay, it'll stay with them for a long time. <laughs> There's another, another question, sort of a, a kind of a maybe more um, local question for this, for this audience um, about what, what, what you, what you saw or experienced in, in, in Rome um, and how that, that's affected um, your work um, maybe uh, going forward. I think these projects were, were, were both more or less in hand while you were there, but what, uh, what, 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 what did you find um, there? Well, it was such an amazing time being in Rome because you know I think also specifically in an academy context, I was sort of obsessed by being in a room with scholars and artists. And, and this is a kind of gross generalization and I'm sure people will be upset about this, but in a good way, like it's for, for, for a good upset, right? Um, this idea of like artists maybe being focused on, on how to address the current moment, right? And that scholarship in many ways is looking way, way, way back and can, and can be very focused on the past, right? And so when you bring these two groups of people together in space, it presents really fascinating and exciting questions about how to address meaning in the world, you know, in the, in the present moment. And so when I was there, I was looking a lot at the Egyptian obelisks and I was, obs I was like, shouldn't they be returned? Like, weren't they stolen? Or like, are they even real? Or what does it mean to not have any context for them? What does it mean to, for popes to put crosses on top of them? Um, and I, I felt like that was a really similar uh, conversation that's happening in America where we have this, this sort of Confederate monuments and you have graffiti on them, right? You have these sort of counter narratives. You have um, two, two truths that are sort of imposing on one another. Um, and I was thinking a lot when I was in Italy about symbols, you know, and how do we agree on symbols? How do we create symbols and objects that, um, that um, have multiple identities and have multiple dialogues attached to them and that everybody uh, feels cool with, you know, is it even possible to do that? And I think that, I mean, certainly I was asking myself those questions with America. Um, and I think that, the installation part of it being my, my very first time working outside, as I said, of two-dimensional space. I was really interested in trying to develop more objects maybe or thinking about what monuments and symbols could be that were, that had multiple meaning, you know, a single thing that had multiple meanings, mm -hmm. you know? That's, that's really interesting because, I mean, Rome it is, it's, it's both, you know, all of those, just in terms of the questions of 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 history and historical meaning and and symbolism it's such a a symbol saturated history saturated place so yeah so you have you know um classical and renaissance and then you know fascist um monuments and and inscriptions and architecture everywhere and it's all kind of piled on top of of 
of everything and you're kind of you 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 sort of make your way through it and you do wonder how the people who live among it whose history it is um make sense of that history or 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 negotiate it but it it's also such a three-dimensional city in a way i mean obviously every city is but there is something about um the 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 presence of sculpture and architecture and and three dimensions so i was i was wondering as 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 you're talking about the 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 transition kind of from 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 two dimensional film um, mm -hmm. to three dimensional um, installation. What when, when, whether just kind of being being in the city and just being in that in that environment um, helped you with it? Right? Yeah, I mean, it absolutely did because I think I think right now I'm really and I fell into working with archive quite a bit, and you know. I, maybe the universe has is like leading me to my to, to answer this big question that I have, but I'm really struggling with how as a filmmaker, I can evoke and elicit the way in which we actually experience life, the way in which we actually know things, which is in 360 degrees, you know what I mean? Um, which has so much context and, and um, you know, in many ways, like, when when you, you when you and I are meeting each other right now, like virtually, like we've had a whole day behind us that's informing our vibe or if we're hungry, like there's so many things that are informing this present moment. And like, how do you show that one frame at a time on a screen? And like, and I'm not sure we've fully investigated that in film. And I think that those questions just became abundantly clear to me when I was looking, as you said, at these physical objects, you know? Um, and thinking about sculpture and thinking about monuments as as forms of narrative um, and as things that are both fixed and flexible you know and sort of asking the same questions to to the practice that i've worked um that i'm working in you know as a filmmaker well bu building on that i have a question that that um i would be hesitant to ask because i'm superstitious to ask it of artists but it's it's from one of your from one of your fellow um artists and and and, and fellow rome prize fellows um who is out there um our friend pamela z um yeah. hello pamela um a brilliant musician and 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 performer um and and an artist um and pamela wants to know and I think is probably not alone in wanting to know what is your next project? What are you, <laughs> what are you working on now? Oh my God. I'm actually speaking of all this. I'm really working on being in the moment and being present. I'm like, I'm trying really hard to, um, to, to understand that the, the, the last two projects that I've put out are getting a little bit closer to these bigger questions that I might be working towards for my whole life, you know? And if I don't take a moment to kind of pause and see what's happened, it, it, I may not get there as quickly as I'd like to. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to, um, I mean, yeah, I'm working on some other stuff, you know what I mean? But, but like true, truly, truly, like in terms of my next, uh, thing I want to dive into, I'm really trying to just be in a place of like really thinking and just being in a place of contemplation. And I think this whole year, like 2020 has just been like, the pause is so crucial, you know, the pause is so crucial for us to see where we are, you know, so I'm trying to replicate that in my life. I have, I think this would be the, the last question, which is, which in a way, I, I think um, dovetails off of that, although it takes it in, in, in maybe a more, um, a more political or activist uh, uh, direction. Um, academics are currently rethinking, given the current political climate, issues of institutional racism, both as blatant in society and latent even in, in, light, in the enlightened context of, whoops, sorry, it just jumped. <laughs> Sorry, in the enlightened context of colleges and universities, how do you as a filmmaker see your role in such efforts? I think that, I mean, that's connected to some of the, the, the historical work that you've, that you've talked about, um, about sort of excavating in, in America these, these, and, and creating these alternative histories and, and alternative um, uh, sets of, of, of images. But that certainly is, you know, part of the historical reckoning that's happening now, not only in, in in the academy, but in in all different sectors of the society, has to do with um, how do we how do we rethink how do we how do we undo 
how do we assess our own um, relation to or complicity with um, racial injustice and 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 structural oppression um, in the past? And it's sort of a a big question to 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 pose to any individual artist. But but I have a feeling it's one that you that you've thought about. Yeah, of course I've thought about it. I mean, I think I think you know, looking at both time in America, I mean, um, I think that in the case of time in particular, there's 2.3 million people that are incarcerated in our country right now. And they have been erased. They're essentially a population that we have no proof of, right? That we have no evidence of in many cases. And that's by design. And so um, right now, the only way in which we can recognize and see what's happening is in the family, is in those that are serving time on the outside. And so I think that um, this, and it's not just so much about this present moment, it's this is the beginning of the new world, right? That what we're dealing with is, is finally um, a, maybe the most public uh, reckoning as a result of a sort of unprecedented white allyship that we've seen in this year um, to systemic problems that have existed from the beginning of our country. As an artist, I think, um, and, and just as a human being, I think that so much of what we need to start paying attention to is that when we see something, it should reveal what it is that we don't see just as much, right? That these two things always are going to be in conversation with each other. Um, and obviously as a filmmaker, that's something I'm grappling with, as you said, you know? Um, but I think that that can apply even in the real world. Who's in the room, who's not in the room, right? But just pay attention. And, um, and to use what's, what's in front of you as, a, as something that hopefully can reveal what isn't, you know? Just as much. That's very, that's very beautifully put it, very, and, and very specific in a way to, to time and to the story of time, because what, one, of, one of the, um, the 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 facts of that film um, that is just you know part of the of the deepest structure of its reality is the absence is the is 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 um, is the absence the, the 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 long and and as far as anyone knows for most of the the, the movies the, the the endless the permanent mm -hmm. um, absence of, uh, of of Fox's husband and um, I think there there's there's when when he finally does, not to spoil it, but I don't know, when 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 he does come back at the end, um, he 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 says very little, and there's something that 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 also relates. I mean, there 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 are silences as well as 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 discourse and and speech, and stories, and there is something about how you in that film hold those in balance have have sort of every every moment of 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 speech be conscious of the silence that that that's 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 also there every moment of of fox and her sons be sort of um pregnant so to speak with the absence of of, of their father and husband um that that i think you you convey in a way that's both you know very specific and grounded in this family's life but is also deeply political and um connected to this history that 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 we've been talking about or these histories that we've been talking about yeah absolutely um well i think we have uh <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Uh, thank uh, you uh, so uh, much oh, and there's mark um what a fantastic and generative talk. Um, thank you, Garrett, for your generous work. And uh, it makes me feel optimistic individually, but also as someone who's at an institution that um, celebrates intellectual searching and creative work, because you're always asking questions but there's a way in which you do it to open doors and make things more comprehensible, to um, take apart the layers of what is a densely stratified and often hidden history. And Tony, you're absolutely right. Rome is a perfect place to always be reminded of those simultaneous histories because it is this three-dimensional grid not grid, it's irregular, it's imperfect, uh, the layers are only partial, 
And that is not a bad way of looking at our own history. Mm -hmm. uh, Garrett, you had said, uh, not black history, but American history. And in this moment, we can only hope for broader understandings for all of uh, Americans and all cultures, uh, which are diverse and complex and can only be reduced when they become uh, monolithic. So thank you to, to both of you for this conversation. I know what a busy time it is for you. And um, thank you again. Let me just have a round of applause if we can do this uh, virtually. <laughs> disembodied audience and um, thank you to all of you for joining us i know you're all kind of zoomed out by this time of the day so i appreciate so many of you uh, joining us uh, we do have one last program in rome which is uh, our melon professor lynn lancaster rome orbs and pencilius a hanging city and its hanging gardens so i look forward to seeing you all again soon have a great evening, and I think we're going to go out with the trailer to time, which seems like an interesting conundrum. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Tony. To Thank you, Mark. Bye. Oh. Uh, Judge's office. My name is Sybil Richardson, and uh, my family is awaiting on a ruling regarding my husband's matter. I was just wondering if you might have any information on, like, an update on it. No, we don't have anything yet. We'll do some money. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay. All have right. Have a weekend. Bye-bye. This is Civil Hi. and again. Uh -huh. Where you at? No, we don't have anything. Alrighty, thank you so much. My twins will be 18 next month. They have absolutely no idea what it means to have a father in their house. What fathers even do. Hello. Did you get any word from over at the big houses no, today? Anything yet? Nothing yet. Okay. You got a chance to call today? I have not. No? Okay. Man, these people have no respect for other human beings' lives. No matter how sane or how understanding you try to be, it just will make you lose your absolute mind. You know how hard I'm going to be smiling when you come home? Success is the best revenge. Success is the best revenge. You're gonna show them that they can't treat human life this way. Success is the best revenge. Just hang in there, because when you get them home, they gonna pay, they gonna pay, they gonna pay. I knew that if it was gonna be, it was gonna be totally up to me.